Today's message is standing in the gap. Standing in the gap. Now, I want to just go ahead and warn the ladies right quick. My first passage of Scripture, you ain't going to like. But give me a minute to let it percolate, and we'll get somewhere with it. And everybody said yes. It's from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. Bear with me now. Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. And right now, every man that's married said, mm, I like that one. That might be my second favorite, favorite verse behind John 3.16 right there. Amen. I'm just kidding. I'm not saying that's how I'm thinking. I said that might be how some of y'all are thinking. Amen. Wives, submit to your own husbands unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now, keep in mind, he's the head of the church, the Savior of the body. He's the head of the church, the provider, the carer of. He is the head, the protector of the church. Amen. Hold on. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, you might be thinking I'm going to be preaching to the ladies today, but I'm not. I want to get the men's attention here for a minute. The reason why he's compared to Christ, but I don't know about y'all, but I have no problem submitting myself to the lordship and leadership of Christ. Amen. Because I know he loves me and cares for me, I trust him completely as the Lord and Savior of my life. Therefore, I can submit to him knowing that God has no ulterior motives, knowing that God's not going to lead me in the wrong direction, knowing that God has already provided for me via his blood. He will continue to provide for me. He will meet my needs. He will be with me and never leave me nor forsake me. So, fellas, before you have your wife want to submit to you as Christ, as, we, as the church does unto Christ, you got to ask yourself a few questions. Am I being the priest of my home? Can my wife trust me unequivocally? Can she believe that I'm going to continue to provide for her, that I'm going to be with her, never leave her, nor forsake her? Can she trust? Oh, come on, somebody. See, I'm really talking to the men in the house today because that's some big, some big words to stand up to. I love how we like the people that are kind of domineering, that are ignorant-minded. Your wife, submit to your husband, blah, blah, blah. You better submit, blah, blah, blah. Okay, husbands, live up to the example of Christ. I didn't get many claps on that one. I didn't get many claps on that one. Ladies, I expected at least a little more from you on that one. Come on. As Christ is the head of the church, so the husband should be. Listen to this. Uh, before we go to Ezekiel, let's go to the next passage. Pastor Jakari, if you can go back there before we go to Ezekiel. I want us to dive in right quick to Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. And it says this, Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. And all God's people said... Nehemiah chapter 4 verses 17 and 18 says this populate in Jesus name well let me get out of my internet go back just my regular signal here have we got it mine ain't opening let me just go to the Bible I reckon here y'all bear with us church this is what happens everybody say help pastor Lord help him there we go I passed it oh there it is we're now looking at the nation of Israel returning to the homeland, the promise of God, the promise that God gave them is being fulfilled. They're being reinserted to the will of God and the perfect will of God in their lives. But there were enemies that did not want to see Israel succeed. There were enemies who did not want to see the homeland rebuilt. There were enemies who did not want to see God's people come into alignment and be what God had called them to be. So they were constant, there was a constant threat of attack. There was a constant threat of violence. So much so that Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 17 says, Those who built... Now these were all men, by the way. These were all men, by the way. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded as his, at his side as he built and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Because there was more than just building, there was more than just protecting. The role was we've got to build and do what God's called us to do. We've got to facilitate what God has called us to do. We've also got, got to be ready to defend against the attack of the enemy. We've got to be willing and ready to protect what God has put us in charge of and what God has put us over. Fathers, can I talk to you today? You've got a big responsibility. Your big responsibility is, number one, to build your house up, to build up your family, to construct them and to edify them and to build them up into children 
children of God, to build them up into disciples of the Most High, to build them up into observers of the laws and statutes of God through His Word. But you also have the other obligation to defend your house, not just from attacks in the carnal world, but from attacks in the spiritual realm as well, that you've got to be standing on guard because let me tell you something, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and the enemy does not want to see your children to be brought up, raised up to serve God. He does not want to see them be built up into being Jesus' followers and disciples of God. He does not want to see your marriage grow into one that is produ productive in the kingdom. So not only are we building, but we also got to have the other obligation that we are standing on guard with the sword girded at our side as we build. Just a little notice of me, but we would read in Scripture that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of the living God. So fathers, men of God, can I just attest to you today that no matter what we're doing, whether we're building up a bank account or building up a house or building up a family, the Word of God ought to be at our side every moment of every day and everything that we do. We can't leave the Word behind and go and be on a building street. we got to have the Word with us Oh, my God. Lastly, let's go to Ezekiel. Here's where my base scripture is today. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall. In Nehemiah, they're literally building up the wall. They've come back. God says, so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. I sought for a man among them to stand in the gap, but I found no one. God bless the reading of his word. Help be a limp to our feet and a light unto our path in Jesus' name. And everybody said, I want to speak to our fathers today. Let me explain something to you. Our calling is to be that builder to be the priest of our home and in, in, in that operation, in that, in that occupation as priest of the home, also to be a builder up. You know, I, I talk to people all the time and, and the thing is, I feel like in today's world, parents nowadays, if we're not careful, we want to be our children's friend. We want them to like us all the time. We want them to feel like, you know, but the reality is it's not my job to raise up friends. God has given me a sacred obligation that my job is because I got two boys. My job is to build up two men of God. That's my job. Sometimes that requires discipline. Sometimes that requires love and care and affection. Sometimes that requires reinforced knowledge. Sometimes that requires me to spend time with them alone. Sometimes that requires intimacy. Sometimes that requires me to defend them. Amen. But that's my job. My obligation is I'm supposed to be building up two young men to be men of God in their lives. That's what God's given the opportunity to do. If we're not careful, we look to the church to do our jobs. I'll never forget there was a, a family in Blackshear, Georgia. My dad pastored the Blackshear Church of God when I was just a small lad, about 11-ish. And so at 11, I was in sixth grade, so we had 6 through 12, just like we do here. And went back, and there was a problem child in our group that was about 16, always into something. Had already been called at school, drinking alcohol and doing all this. And his parents come and met my dad one day. Now, these people were not faithful attenders. They'd show up about once every three or four Sundays. Their son would be at youth group about one Wednesday night a month. And they showed up one time because he was getting expelled from school, and they had to take him to another school. And they came and sat in my father's office and said, they, they, here's their words verbatim, the church has failed my son. And see, y'all think I'm brash. But the apple don't far, far, fall far from the proverbial tree. And my father didn't say, you know, well, sister, you got to understand. Well, let me try to explain. He looked at him and said, hold on a minute. Hold on. We get your son about four hours a month you got him all the other time. I wouldn't say the church has failed your son. I'd say you failed your son. Oh, oh, they never come back. But the truth remains. The truth ain't easy sometimes, but that's the truth. Who, who in their right mind will blame the church who got this kid four hours a month? I mean, but that's the mindset. They had, they had passed the buck of raising up their child in the house of God and becoming a godly individual, pass that on the church. Friend, can I tell you, 
our children's staff, as good as they are, as much as they care and love your kids, if you come every Sunday of the month, if you come every Sunday of the year, they get them for 35, 40 minutes a week. That's it. The responsibility, moms and dads today, Father's Day, to raise up men and women of God in your house is not the church's responsibility. It's not Pastor Josh's responsibility. You are the priest of your home. I'm not the priest of your home. It's your job to raise up men and women of God in your house. It's not my job to stand in the gap and pray and fast and cry out in the middle of the night for your lost child. That's your responsibility. I'll gladly help you in the calls. Hello, come on, somebody. But you got to understand today, ain't nobody going to care for your child like you do. Listen, I love all our kids here. God knows I do. I love getting hugs from them. I care for them immensely. But the reality is, as much as I love them, my love for your child cannot compare to your love for your child. And just like any of y'all that happen to love my kids, your love for them ain't going to come nowhere near my love for my children. And we've got to understand, nobody's going to do right by them more than we are. So why are we not rising to the occasion, men of God and fathers? Why are we not becoming the priests of our homes? Why are we not building them up and protecting and defending them at the same time? Why are we not watchful with the Word of God by our side as our direction, as our guide, as what we depend on? Come on, y'all ain't here nobody helping me today, and that's okay. Because the reality is... And I think we, we preach about it and talk about it so much that it becomes rhetoric for us that it loses its power and its meaning. But you have to understand that it's in the Word for a reason. And this is not a lie today. This is not a fairy tale horror story. This is not some Brothers Grimm uh, story that we read at bedtime. This is the truth of the matter. We have a very real adversary. We have a very real enemy called the devil. We have a very real adversary against us in a place called hell. There are demonic forces. Matter of fact, Paul says it this way, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and strongholds and spirits of wickedness in high places. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. But we have forgotten that there's a very real fact that the enemy today, not only would he love to destroy your marriage, not only would he love to destroy your family, not only would he love to destroy your children, but he would love it so much that every moment of every day he is scheming, planning, devising, and trying his absolute best to destroy you and your family every day. I'm not making it up. We forget about it. It's uncomfortable, and maybe we don't know exactly how to come against it, but we don't realize it. We don't think about that every day, but guess what? The enemy thinks about it every day. The enemy tries every day to destroy your children. He tries every day to fill their heads with a bunch of junk on social media. He tries every day to push agendas in the world today through school systems. He tries every day to show people of influence in their lives to lead them astray every single day. We forget it don't take but one time for a child to get drunk behind the wheel to end his life. We forget it don't take but our little child, because they don't want to bother us, is going through hell at school, being bullied, going through depression and anxiety. All it takes is one time then to put a, a belt or some kind of rope around their neck, them not thinking clear, and then they're gone forever. We forget that. We forget it don't take but one time laying with somebody they ain't married to to get pregnant and now have a youngin'. And there needs to be somebody willing to stand in the gap for your family. I'm going to tell you right now. Stand up. Come here, Brother Bill, if I can. Come here, Brother Bill. Come here. Brother Ray, come here if you would. Billy, come here if you would. Come on, come on, Billy, if you can. If you don't mind. I just want three able-bodied, big-bodied men to be up here. Now, I don't know about y'all. Big Chris, where are you at? You here, Big Chris, or are you doing security outside today? He's not here. I don't know about y'all, but there ain't nothing in me right now that would just want to tangle with these three at once. There ain't nothing in me right now that's saying, you know what, I'd really like for all three of these men to be mad at me and be really angry and me to have to fight all three of them at the same time. There ain't nothing in me that wants to come against these three big, powerful, strong men at all. However... If one of my children was on the other side of these men and they were being tormented or being physically hurt, they might need three more. 
They might need to have more than three to stop me from getting to my young. You get what I'm saying? There ain't nothing in me naturally that wants to come against them at all. However, if my child was on the other side and these three men were standing between me and getting to my youngin, so help you God, I will rip your eyes out. Yo, I will beat you. To, I will, I'll get a two-by-four, a baseball bat, whatever I got to do. You don't want to be against me in that situation. Amen. I mean, just look at these just big power. And right now, there ain't nothing in me. Oh, God, I don't want to have to deal with that. But if my child was depending on me to get through these men to get to them, I promise you there would not be an ounce of fear in me. I would not have to sit back and think about it. I would go head first with reckless abandon, trying to do whatever I got to do to get through them to get them. Come on, somebody. Y'all give them a hand. Thank you, gentlemen. That's all I thank you for your, your, your imposing statures and physiques. There ain't nothing. I don't want to come face to face with a bear out in nature. There ain't nothing about me want to face off with a big old black bear in a swamp when I'm going hunting or something. You feel me? But if there was a bear standing between me and my hurt and youngin', the bear better eat his Wheaties. <laughs> Jokes aside, you get the point. You get the point. Well, friend, the reality is that is life every day for you as parents with your children. They need you. They're depending on you. Matter of fact, because we get busy, well, listen, we can't blame the kids. Some of us as parents, we got our heads so stuck down in a cell phone, we don't even talk at dinner. We're just as bad as a child is with a cell phone. Amen. We got a child sitting here hurting when all the signs are there, but we don't even see that they're hurting because we're so caught up in ourselves. We're not even looking at the signs of a hurting child in our lives. Who's going to stand in the gap for your child? Same thing with my wife. Like I said, I, I, I said a couple weeks ago when they called me at 7.05 in the morning, your wife's been in a bad wreck, get here. I didn't take time to, to brush my hair. I'm just being real with you. They me up. I didn't even take, I didn't even brush my teeth. I just took off. I grabbed a, grabbed a pair of shorts and grabbed a shirt and took off. Because I had to get to this woman. You feel what I'm saying? And I didn't matter. I flew with the flashers on. I didn't care if a cop got behind me. You have to follow me to the place, buddy. I ain't stopping. <laughs> just follow me, sir. We're going to get there. And then I, you rest me after. I got to check on my wife, right? Because there wasn't nothing going to stop me from getting to my wife when she needed me. There ain't nothing going to come between, because that's my wife, that is my helpmate, that is my soulmate, the love of my life. See, some of us might forget that, but I remember who I married. I remember why. And whatever I got to do to get to her, I'm willing to do. Husbands, fathers, the same thing even today in our marriage. Your, your wife needs you now. She needs you. She don't, there, there's not a time when she's going to stop needing you to be the man of God in her life, to be her husband and protector. Here's what I'm telling you, guys. I'm not going to be long, but I'm just trying to paint this picture so we can understand. To be the priest of the home, to be a father, to be a godly father is not a small task, and in reality, nor is it an easy one. It requires discipline. It requires effort. It requires time. It requires energy. It requires hours of prayer. It requires us reading God's Word. In short, it requires us to grow up. Mm -hmm. Some of us still got a 25-year-old mindset, and it shows. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Go ahead and, keep, go ahead and be immature and stay a child. Here's what's going to happen. You keep playing around with your folly, you'll lose that wife, you'll lose those kids, you'll lose your family. Because the children don't do the defending. The man does. You don't send boys to go, oh, come on now. And so the reality, again, is we got to think about this. Every day the enemy has a plot, a plan, a scheme to try to destroy your children, your family, your marriage, your wife, everything that you hold dear. You say, well, Pastor, what if I'm single? I'm a single parent. Cool, this applies to you too. Every day it's happening. And God is looking for somebody. Matter of fact, our job is to stand in the gap, build with one hand, defend with the other, because there's not going to be a single day that we live through that we endure where the enemy's not trying, and it's not necessary for us to be a people of prayer, a people of power. That's every day. But we have to be intentional because it don't just happen. I don't roll out of bed in the morning and just say, well, I'm ready to accomplish everything. I'm just going to be the man of God and just go through my life. No, we have to, it requires us to be intentional. You've got to make time to make time. I get it. 
And that can be a daunting task. But here's the thing. The reality is, let's just be real about it. The reality is we would love to have any other way than that. We always look for ease and comfort. But I would challenge you today, what if there is no other way? And the reality is there ain't no other way because there ain't nobody else going to stand in your gap. Your daddy ain't going to stand in your gap when you're a grown man. That's why I'm raising my sons right now. I can't help you when you get 18, 25, son. I ain't going to be able to come into your house and tell you and your wife how to do things. I ain't going to be able to tell you by the time you're 25, I ain't going to be able to tell you what to spend money on and what not to spend money on. At 25, I ain't going to be able to tell you where to go to church, when to go to church, how to read. I've got to do it now while they're young enough and instill this to them while they're my youngest so they grow up into the men of God. I don't have time to wait. For another opportunity I don't have time to wait for a better time in my life I'm just real busy right now there's a lot going on nobody else is going to do it for you fathers that's how important you are and I'm going to close in just a minute but to show you how important it is and this is not downplaying the, the importance of, of a mother please ladies y'all know that we did Mother's Day I told you how beautiful and how precious how awesome you are but there's a very real thing how many of y'all know numbers don't lie stats don't lie one plus one equals two it don't matter how else you think about it. You can, in your mind, you can try to make 1 plus 1 equals 17. It'll never work. 1 plus 1 will always be 2. You might not like the fact that it's 2. You may try to do and throw, throw in all kinds of variables and try to decorate it. But, friend, 1 plus 1 will always be 2 because the numbers just don't lie. You feel me? Like the number 10%, which is what tithe is. That don't lie. Now, some of y'all say you're tithing, but you give 6%, but you ain't tithing. Y'all tell she on the finance committee. Because <laughs> Jenny's like, oh, I like that one. Hey, hit them where. <laughs> but that's the reality. One plus one always equals two. That, that, that's how it is. There's no, there's no way to, to, to work around that. It's just how it is. And thus is true when it comes to our families. Fathers, the statistics don't lie. 80% of the men that are in prison today grew up without a father. 80%. Only, tw only 20% in the prison had a father. People are going to make mistakes. I get it. That happens all the time. But it shows you. When you go to that, you talk about people who do violent crimes. You talk about people who, who, uh, who, who, who uh, operate when it comes to uh, not just that, but ethics. A father matters. A father and household matters. When it talks to people who, uh, uh, who, who chase destructive lifestyles, when it comes to alcohol abuse and drug users. Look it up for yourself. Look up the statistics. You can look for yourself. Look up the stats for those who end up with addictions and strongholds in their life and abuse alcohol and drugs. Look at the percent of without a father. Pastor, why are you telling us that? Because they needed a father to stand in the gap and to fight for them, to protect them against the attack of the enemy. Stats don't lie. That puts a big burden on a man's shoulders. Well, guess what? God designed you biologically so your shoulders is wider anyway. You got a wider back for a reason. You know, biologically, men have denser bones than women. Denser muscles than women. You know why? Because God knew that you'd have to carry some weight around. God knew that you'd have to be strong in some ways. Y'all be all quiet all you want tonight. Some of y'all trying to be feminist and act like I'm tearing down women. I'm not at all. I'm not at all. But there's a, the reality is, ladies, I love you, but you've been forced into doing stuff that you shouldn't have had to do. Because some low-down dog didn't want to stand up and be a man. That's just a fact of the matter. So I'm calling on the men of God in this house today. Is there anybody willing to stand in the gap for your family, for your wife, for your children? Because they know, is anybody sick and tired of seeing the families of God ransacked and the enemy running roughshod in the house of God, taking our children out of church? Take, I'm sick and tired of it. I'm ready for the men of God in the house to stand up and get ready and be willing to mind the gap and stand in the gap for their families. Be ready to instill the word of God and to fight on the other that's just a fact of life and when I look at my sons as much as I love your children I love mine more as much as I love each one of y'all in this room today if I had to choose between one of y'all and my youngest I'm sorry bye and if you're offended you got it twisted there shouldn't be any other way 
I was watching a video we have. I want you to see this right quick. Pastor Carl, can we show this video? See, my father still go. From then on, God says, you no longer are a murderer. You are a conqueror. You are an ambassador. And you are an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the words of your testimony. That little death row cell, before it was dark, ugly, unhealthy. It became my temple. It became a time to worship and build a relationship. Between. I remember seeing my father still go. My own. Nothing happened. Then I remember crying out in the name of Jesus. And boom, something happened to me. It was like a thousand pounds fell off of my back. And for once I had that peace that surpasses all understanding. I took that hope back into the men right there in Seg. From then on, God says, you no longer are a murderer. You are a conqueror, you are an ambassador, and you are an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the words of your testimony. That little death row cell, before it was dark, ugly, unhealthy, it became my temple. It became a time to worship and build a relationship between, between me and God. Come on, somebody, what a testimony. Because men, not only is it important to be there to stand the gap, but what we do matters. Because there are little eyes watching you. This could be applied to mamas too. This is every parent. If we're not careful, we'll take this blase approach of do as I say, not as I do. But the greatest testimony, the most powerful testimony and impact that your children will ever see is you. Why is it important to read our Bible every day and pray and stand in the gap? Because if your children see a, a father and a mother who ain't praying, who don't ever come to church, who don't ever open a Bible, guess what they're going to do? They're not going to come to church. They're not going to open a Bible. They're never going to pray. You know why people are abusive? Because they're repeating patterns, what they grew up in and saw. Boy, wouldn't it be nice to have a generation of young people and young men and women in the house of God to grow up seeing godly fathers and godly mamas praying and reading their Bible and coming to church and serving in the house of God? I wonder what that would produce. I wonder what little Garcia would have been had his daddy been in church with him all the time, taking him to revival services. <laughs> oh, yes, a great testimony. He found Jesus in the prison cell, but I would much rather my child find Jesus here than to wind up in a prison cell. And he can. And that's what the whole point of that is. Little Garcia, he fell into what he saw. That was his witness. That was his testimony. That was his example. Had he had a godly example, guess what would have happened to little Garcia? He'd have been a godly example. Never would have had to go to the prison place. But thank God that even in a prison place, as a murderer, the blood of Jesus was shed. They could be born again. Here's the last part I'm going to tell you. Would you stand to your feet this morning with me? I recently spoke with a brother who, who was a, a pastor who lost his son a few years back. He told me, he said, Josh, it's the single most painful thing I've ever endured in my life. He said, to this day, I hurt it affects me. It hadn't eased off. It doesn't hurt less. I don't think about him. I think about him every day. He said, and I would have done anything to stop him from dying. Had I been able, he said, I would have took it upon myself. I would have done anything. I'd have paid any amount. I'd have done anything for anybody. If I could have done anything to keep my son from dying, I would have done it. But I had no option. He said, but what it, the one thing it has done is it taught me the love of, the, of our Father in heaven. He was watching his son die, and he had the option to stop it. God didn't have to let his son die. And the person of, the person of God, the Father, we, get what we, we feel like we feel because it, it was ripping him apart. Even though he's Almighty God, it was destroying him to watch his son die on a cross. And he had the option. He had the power. He could have stepped in and stopped it. But he loved us so much that he chose to watch his son die that we could be saved. Wow. 
That's why that testimony is possible. If anything else, we should respond to the love of the Father today and the call of that Father upon us as men, and men of God to be godly fathers and priests of our homes because He gave His Son's life that you and I could be saved. He watched and paid the ultimate price, the greatest sacrifice, so that you and I could be who we are today. And I'm telling y'all right now, I don't care if it was a busload of people, a cruise ship full of people, I don't think I could give up my son for the greater good of any, any number of people. Call it selfish, call it whatever. I couldn't give, I couldn't watch my young and die in place of anybody else. But God in his infinite love for us. Let that come alive a minute to you today. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die. To bleed out on a sinner's cross. That's how much God loved us because whosoever then would believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life.